to stand on its own as uh, Boy Joy's greatest hit. Um, huge increases in value haven't translated into the same for uh, increases in tax revenue. We're going to go through slides on each of these. Uh, proposition two and a half limits have not kept up with inflation. And lastly, there's no concurrent limit on expenditure growth. Proposition two and a half limits the amount of revenues you can raise, but doesn't say anything about the expenditure side. So let's look at some of these. I should have managed in the 80s. Barry, I wish I was born in 47. I'd be retired now and I would have managed through the 80s. Um, the first point I made up, uh, Proposition 2.5 in the 80s was covered up by a huge influx of local aid uh, during the decade of the 80s. Anyone want to take a guess at the percentage over a 10-year period that uh, local aid went up in Massachusetts? Non-school local aid. This is lottery <coughs> assistance, uh, lottery and additional assistance. Oh, wow. 425%. Now, I am not a math major. But when I divide 10 into 425%, that tells me that the state of Massachusetts, in response to Proposition 2 and a half, said to cities and towns, we are going to raise property tax, or we will, we have raised property taxes by the end of the decade by 42.5% per year. DJ, how would you like to be an MMA during that period, right? 42.5% per year. The next decade, 7%. So now, the decade of the 90s, the termites are on the foundation, right? The first couple of years, termites, you don't need to know, you don't know what's going on, they don't do anything, but they're there. You don't do anything about it. Eventually, the termites are going to do what? They're going to eat away at the foundation. This is what's happened this decade. Down 22%. So, you know, the, the, the pessimist that I am uh, about Proposition 2.5, um, you know, I say that Proposition 2.5 has really only succeeded, succeeded because the state uh, brought so much money to the table to begin with, but the state could not possibly sustain, sustain such a huge increase decade after decade after decade. So um, that's the experience that we're having. Now, this is a spin alert. Um, I hate when the facts get in the way of a good point. I just made a good point, but I do have to defend the state. By the way, in, in saying this, I don't blame the state for being down 22%. I, I, I'm of the opposite uh, opinion. I, I congratulate state officials for uh, uh, spending so much money in the in the 80s, but the fact of the matter is that as we're talking about public policy, we need to recognize why Proposition Two and a Half um, has been able to survive and figure something out. I got a spin alert here, and that's um, while the state was not spending money on non-school things, they were certainly sending more money back in forms of school aid. So um, every form in the late 80s resulted in a 135 percent increase in school aid. In the 90s, that's uh, tripled down to 39 percent. You know, so I put them all together and averaged out, and you know, you see that this decade, um, aid in most three major categories is up 29 percent. You know, some people say, "Geez, that's that's reasonable. It's 2.9 percent a year. That's something to live with." But understand that in cities, uh, in cities and towns, we cannot do anything with state aid, uh, with school aid except send it to the schools. So. Um, I don't know if there's any school officials here, and I don't mean to embarrass you if I am, but during this, during a, uh, a portion of time, uh, during this decade, as non-school aid was continuing to decline, we were sending more and more and more ed aid to cities and towns. You know, we were almost forcing the education aid down the throats of schools. Spend this money, spend this money, spend this money. Now the problem is that we're cutting ed aid. You know, we're going to see um, huge results uh, in, um, in, our, um, in our schools in the next coming years as the stimulus money that the feds have provided um, fall off the table. So uh, how about a little uh, something for the effort? Uh, um, number two, the proposition two and a half has not uh, kept up with the way that values uh, have grown in communities. And this is something that bothers me a lot. Statewide, over the last decade, values are up 122%. Um, yet during that same period of time, taxes only went up 63%. You know, I would argue that there should be some uh, more direct correlation between those two. but the more disappointing thing for me is that if you think about cities that weren't attractive places 10 years ago and somehow were able to make themselves more attractive and invest more, uh, attract more investment, oftentimes that investment attracted into the community didn't translate into additional tax revenues. Let's take, for instance, Lowell. I love Lowell. Um, one of the places that I would love to manage is Lowell. And I, I think Lowell has um, a, a real special uh, something that um, gets me excited every time I drive through there. The people in Lowell have done a great job 
at um, continuing to um, produce uh, amazing rejuvenation in the community. The values are up more than statewide, up 157%. And yet their tax increases have trailed the state at 54%. That's because Proposition 2 and a half does not allow you to gain um, additional values when skyrocketing property values take place uh, in your property. So if I bought a home in uh, 2000 and Lowell for $100,000, and by the end of the decade, it was worth $300,000, the effect of that is not felt by the city of town. Just to uh, show you, Chelsea, um, we've actually done uh, a, a little bit better. We, we're up 172% uh, since um, uh, 2000, and yet our tax receipts are only up 64%. So Proposition 2 and a half doesn't allow us a little something for the effort. We're making huge efforts to attract investment in the community, and yet property tax alone doesn't allow us uh, to make up for that. Meanwhile, things are slip sliding away. Mm -hmm. um, proposition two and a half, two and a half percent hasn't kept up with inflation. Uh, since Proposition two and a half was adopted, inflation has exceeded two and a half percent 22 out of 29 years. So we have been slip sliding away. The termites have been at the foundation. The foundation is becoming weaker and weaker. The average inflation during that period of time has been 3.9 percent, almost 50 percent more than the two and a half percent Proposition two and a half allows. And I can't, every time I look at this number, you, you people that bought homes in 1980, I don't know how you did it. Inflation was 13.5% in 1980. Wow, what a terrible time that was. Uh, the low during this period of time has been 1.55%, with the exception now of this current year, it looks like we'll have um, some uh, reduction. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that if 2.5% is your major or second major source of revenue and it's not keeping up with inflation, uh, that's a real problem. Lastly, if you want me to take the cake, can't you allow me to eat it too? Um, proposition two and a half limits the revenue side, but it doesn't limit the expenditure side. So general inflation was eating away at the, uh, the revenues that I was taking in. The cost of maintaining and aging infrastructure continues to be a problem. I am alarmed at what's happening between Vermont and New York with the Lake Champlain Bridge. I'm afraid to drive over bridges. You know, any one of us could have driven over that bridge and fall apart. Don't we in the Commonwealth, don't we in the country want to make sure that infrastructure is maintained? And yet, the cost of maintaining aging infrastructure keeps on going up and up and up. $80 million just to fix that bridge. Imagine multiplying that by the tens of thousands of bridges that are around. So, um, employee benefits are, are the other part here that um, there's no cap on employee benefits. So in Chelsea, we're up 100% on employee benefits this decade. I have no control over health insurance. I have no control over my pension costs. And that's up 100% even though my employment levels are down 7%. So here's a, here's a quick look at this. Health insurance is sickening. When I became city manager in FY01, uh, health insurance was a little less than 6% of the total budget. Every dollar we spent, we spent about six cents on health insurance. 10 years later, uh, it's at 13% and it's promising to go up and up. Health insurance has averaged this decade an increase of 14% annually. Remember, 2.5% versus 14% just on health insurance. Uh, thank you, sir. May I have another? Um, FY10 is another in a long line of financially stressful years for cities and towns. Uh, we've seen historic local aid cuts uh, this year where we're down 30% in the local aid with our overall revenues being down 5%. Fact it all in, our revenues in Chelsea are just up 2.5% a year this decade. Uh, health insurance up 14%. Uh, employee benefits overall up 10%. Uh, health insurance, uh, I'm sorry, infrastructure stuff, it's just amazing. So, uh, impacts uh, this year, half of our municipal departments, these are non-school issues, um, have had their budgets reduced. Uh, we're ready to eliminate another positions next week, uh, another 20 positions next week. We'll be down 20% of employment from 02. That can't be good uh, for our residents of cities and towns. Fees and fines are being raised again, but we can only raise them so far. We can't make up for other limitations with that. Capital investments, I think about Lake Champlain Bridge all the time, but we're deferring capital investments again and our reserves continue to decrease. Um, total revenue loss this year supporting non-school activities, 15%. We have to make up 15% somehow. We've been tightening our belt uh, for more than 20 years. So, last slide. The benevolent dictator says these are the things that we need to do in order to help cities and towns um, stay uh, afloat. Uh, number one, we need health insurance relief. You may have heard, you may have uh, been involved if you're on the local level, but um, the state mandates that we cities and towns negotiate health insurance across the collective bargaining table. There's very little way of getting um, unions to agree that they should pay more for their health insurance um, in order to uh, save jobs or to balance budgets. And yet, 
the option that we have put out there to join the state's health insurance system, the same health insurance system that the legislature has and the governor has, um, is being turned away by, um, by uh, the union. So uh, many of us in the municipal side believe that we need management rights, municipal rights, to uh, determine what health insurance would be. And if that was the case, we wouldn't be seeing 14% increases in health insurance on a yearly basis. Pension reforms are a must. I spend more on paying old pension debt from the days when mayors in the 80s and 70s and 60s gave away money in return for votes um, than I do on infrastructure in the city. Um, I spend more overall on pensions than I do on policing in the city, or more on pensions than I do on public safety in the city. Uh, we need pension reform. Pension reform has to include uh, changing when uh, people are eligible for maximum <coughs> benefits. Uh, regionalism is a must. Uh, I saw Jim around here, Jim Gallagher's around somewhere at MAPC. My friends at MAPC are working with us, as well as MMA, on uh, regionalism efforts. We can do regionalize. If all of us were, were brought into this uh, barren state and said, put together uh, forms of government now, we certainly wouldn't have the, the forms of government we have with you know, 300 E911 centers and 300 police chiefs and 300 fire chiefs. So regionalism coordination is important. We need state help to do that because cities and towns can't recreate the wheel every time. I can't be going next door and asking my neighbor, what do you think about this or what do you think about that? Somebody from the state or somebody from higher up needs to come in and help us uh, by uh, bringing the uh, best practices forward. Uh, charter school financing reforms are a must. Charter schools are not a bad thing, but the way they're financed are. In uh, the town of Somerville right now, they're making cuts in their uh, local school department and, local, and their uh, charter school has a $12 million surplus and isn't cutting its budget. We need to have equity relative to uh, how we finance charter schools. Uh, continuing support for every form, we need to do a better job educating our kids, that goes without saying. As well as, if I'm the benevolent dictator, I can hope for these things. A new local aid commitment. Uh, the local aid doesn't work the way it is. We need to restructure it around uh, something that uh, many of us have been trying to advance called partnership aid. Uh, recalibration of Proposition 2.5. You know, it was 30 years ago when Proposition 2.5 was adopted. You know, uh, we need to um, change the way uh, we look at Proposition 2.5 and, and update it for uh, current year. I'm not against restricting uh, revenues, but I do think it needs to be recalibrated. And lastly, you know, maybe we should consider uh, consolidation of jurisdictions um, under a benevolent dictator, I'm available. So, um, <laughs> I want to thank you all for listening. I'm going to uh, ask uh, Mike Whitman to come up, and as Mike comes up, I want to thank Mike uh, for all he's done uh, in uh, leading public policy in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Barry said that Mike may not be the most fun guy, but that's not true. Because Mike tells many jokes these days, it's about how bad things are going to get, and uh, I'm sure I'll have a few more. Uh, Mike's been probably the most unheralded guy in the success that we've had in Massachusetts um, over the years, and that's Taxpayers Foundation has been a leading advocate for uh, responsible tax policy, but not crazy tax policy. And um, I'm glad that Mike's been around to lead that. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, follow